Grandpa stole his first buggy in 1892. Uh, I met your grandma pig slopping in 46. Oh, every Christmas we'd visit my Uncle Fred in prison. And welcome in to America's Family History Show, Extreme Jeans and ExtremeJeans.com. I am Fisher, your radio root sleuth on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. We have so much going on today. Where do we begin? First of all, I'll tell you that we got a couple of great guests as always. We're going to be talking later in the show to Vivian and Simona. These were two of the ladies, mother and daughter, who went to Simona's home country of Slovakia on BYU TV show called How I Got Here. It's amazing. It's emotional. You're going to want to hear what they have to say about the experience. Plus, we got Phyllis Biffle Elmore on. She's written a book about the quilt of souls. And this has to do with the Underground Railroad and her ancestors and how they would signal directions on the Underground Railroad using quilts and other methods. It's absolutely amazing stuff coming up in about 10 minutes. And right now, let's just go right to David, because, David, we've got so much on our plate today. I don't know how we're going to fit it all in. But let's start with the good news that Diane Southard, our good friend, Your DNA Guide, is the host of a brand new PBS TV show called Your DNA Secrets Revealed, actually debuted Saturday the 26th, and I'm so excited for her. Yeah, no, that's great, Diane. Really cuts it down to the basics for anybody to learn about DNA, and she's been around the lecture circuit for a while, so I tip my hat to her, and I hope that maybe her show influences more people to do DNA testing so we can find more yeah. matches out there. Now, we're going to so. have to get her on to talk about this. This is such good news. And you got some attention recently yourself in the <laughs> press, haven't you? Well, uh, Nathan Dillon Goodwin, we just had him on the show a couple of weeks ago talking about his new book, The Sawtooth Slayer, and mm-hmm. if you're not familiar with him, he writes genealogical thrillers. Now, that, that seems kind of like a diametrically opposed thing. What it is is solving cold cases in many cases, but this book is about an active serial killer. And in the middle of this book, they have me actually interviewing one of the researchers in this <sighs> in this novel. So find it on page 65 of the book. It's really quite fun. I got a good yeah. laugh out of it. You're not the serial killer? Well, I'm glad so. he didn't work me into that role. <laughs> and you were in Salt Lake City last week, David, uh, doing a little work. How did it go? I, good. I was out there with 38 people with NEHGS for our annual trip out there. But in the evenings, I have my own time. And you remember the story about a year ago I told you about my third great grandfather in the War of 1812. He was 44. Uh, yeah. I thought he was an old soldier. Yeah. Well, one of my ancestors came from Connecticut. Stephen Sands fights in the Revolutionary War for the wrong side. He fights for the loyalist. Uh, no offense to my Canadian friends up there and up the north. But then I see that he signs up and fights in the military again, being a soldier in the War of 1812 at the age of 63. Ooh. It's on the same pension file. So <laughs> 44 has nothing on 63, no. but I'll tell you, that's some good gumption to be in there. So I have a War of 1812 veteran a year later on both sides of the war. That is really fun. And have you ever heard of the Declaration of Dependence, speaking of loyalists? <sighs> I have, but I don't know a lot about it. What can you tell me? (laughs) 1776, November, New York City. It was a group of loyalist citizens of the city who wrote to Admiral Howe and General Howe, pledging their loyalty to the king. And I just found this thing. I'd never heard of it before and found Mm. that my fifth great grandfather, Elijah Gallaudet's brother, was on there. So here was Elisha, who was Mm -hmm. a patriot, and his brother was a loyalist. And speaking of Elisha, by the way... With a little work, I was able to figure out that his house that he lived in before he fled New York ahead of the British occupation, he went to New Jersey, his house was burned in the Great Fire of 1776 there. I found the burn map of the city and the fire, and using a couple of newspaper ads, I was able to pinpoint exactly where his house stood, and it had to have gone down in the fire. So just an amazing little discovery there. Well, usually we don't mention birthday parties for 90-year-olds. Joan Schaefer from Iowa celebrated her birthday, but the amazing thing is the oldest person in America, her mother, was there. Her mother also (laughs) recently turned 115 fish. Oh, 
Really? And so Bessie Hendricks from Iowa, happy 115 years young. That's amazing. And her 90-year-old daughter was at the party. That's incredible. Well, going back a few years before that, one of the bloodiest battles of the Revolutionary War was in Camden, South Carolina. Well, the stories are not over because they've just excavated fish 14 veterans from that war in the battlefield. Wow. And as I understand it, two of them were British soldiers. One of them was a Tory and the other 12 were patriots. And so they're finding Mm -hmm. all kinds of things connected with those bodies, you know, buttons and weapons. It's amazing the research they're going to be able to do with this find. It is. So, I mean, it just goes to show you the textbook doesn't really close on something when you have archaeologists (laughs) in the mix, that's for sure. And now with technology, we can rediscover history while we still have people alive that remember it. And AI technology has helped an 86-year-old woman from New York reconnect with her family photos. This technology is amazing, Fish. Daniel Pat has created a website that is called Numbers to Names. Is using facial recognition technology to identify people in photos and match them. She had a picture of herself with her family, but this matched a school picture perfectly. Yeah, from 80-some-odd uh, years ago, and she just can't believe it, and it's really remarkable to see this story. And she survived the Holocaust. She lost her siblings and her own mother. Mm. She was hidden by her aunt. Speaking of World War II, there is now a book of remembrance that is covering over, ready for this, 125,284 Japanese Americans who were incarcerated during World War II after Pearl Harbor. Yeah, it's the first named database ever created, and it's massive, which is an amazing accomplishment. Well, that's what I have from Beantown this week. Don't forget, if you're not a member of American Ancestors, we hope you will become one and use the coupon code EXTREME and save $20 on AmericanAncestors.org on a membership. All right, David. He is David Allen Lambert, the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. Talk to you at the back end of the show, David, for Ask Us Anything. And coming up next, the quilt of souls. You're going to want to hear this story about how quilts were used to help escaping slaves get away during the Civil War with my guest, Phyllis Biffle Elmore, in three minutes. Have you hit a brick wall in your family tree? Are you unsure how to use your DNA test results to resolve a research question? Do you want to travel where your ancestors walked and need to find details before you go? Need help joining a lineage society? Whatever your genealogy research question, the answer is Legacy Tree Genealogist. Legacy Tree Genealogist has been helping clients all over the globe discover their story since 2004. Legacy Tree has carefully selected and trained professionals who specialize in hundreds of countries and languages, as well as probate research and DNA analysis. And when you need experts on the ground in the countries where your ancestors came from, Legacy Tree Genealogists calls upon its global network of on-site researchers who know the local language and how to get their hands on the records you need. Request your free quote today at LegacyTree.com. That's LegacyTree.com. Genies, our friends at BYU TV have a new series out created just for us, family historians. It's called How I Got Here. It's a fast paced travel show where young adults accompany their immigrant parents back to where they came from, their countries of origin. These are 10 day trips of a lifetime where these parent child duos relive the sacrifice, struggle and circumstances that led their families to leave to where they are now. There's a new episode every week with visited countries including Italy, Serbia, Mexico, Chile, Israel, Slovakia, and Ghana. BYU TV is on Roku and Fire Stick, online at BYUtv.org, or through the BYU TV app. How I Got Here is available now with a new episode every week. Feel the impact this journey has on those who grew up not knowing. And just a warning, keep a box of Kleenex nearby. You're going to need it. 
genies if you haven't done so yet. You've got to check out Ancestry.com's new storytelling creation center, Ancestry Stories. Their story builder allows you to create a story with six different slide types, including a title page, a photo display page, including stock pictures they provide, and documents, and you can write a summary. And with those photos, you can add motion, panning left to right or right to left. For now, these stories can only be created on your iPhone, but Android is still to come and can be saved to your ancestors' pages on your trees. You can then access via phone, and in time, it'll appear on your desktop. You can also share it with family members and friends, whether or not they subscribe to Ancestry.com. For the younger generation that wants stories in a quick and easy-to-consume form, you can't beat this. I've already shared a story with my family, and the reactions are remarkable. Try out these incredible new tools and share your new story creations on social media using hashtag MyAncestryStory. And welcome back to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. I am Fisher, your radio root sleuth, and I am always thrilled to hear about people's stories, the things they've dug up and some of the things they've written. And a brand new book is out, written by my next guest, Phyllis Biffle Elmore. It's called Quilt of Souls. It's a memoir. And uh, first of all, Phyllis, welcome to the show. Congratulations on all you've been able to accomplish in getting this book out. It looks fascinating. Thank you, and thank you for having me. I'm honored to be a guest on your show. Well, look at this. Quilting traditions in Africa long before slavery, and it all was brought over. And first of all, how did you find out about these stories about quilting from your own family? I'm originally from Michigan, but my parents sent me south to live with my grandparents uh, for about 10 years. This was in 1957. I was four years old. And when I got there, I was with people that I had never met before. Then my grandmother was a quilter. I I found out that later on a couple couple of days after I had been there because she pulled out this old musty quilt that was half sewn and she put it over me so I could stop shaking because I was I was shaking not out of being cold, but out of fear Mm. of being strange place. So I found out later on that through the years of living with my grandmother, she made quilts and she only made quilts from people who had passed on. She wouldn't mix new material and the fabric of someone who was alive. She wouldn't put that cloth in her quilts. And the quilt that she had gave me that night, it was started by her mother, who was an ex-slave. So when she put that quilt on me over those 10 years I was there, she would tell me stories of the quilts that she was making because people would come and they would drop off quilts of their relatives that had passed on. And as she sewed, she knew the story of most of the people whose cloth she was making a quilt. I would look at as she would place the finished quilt in that family member's hand. So it was it was almost huh. like a talisman because she would say that these quilts would protect these people from harm and danger, and it would be with them for the rest of their life, just like my quilt of sews, which I have today, that my grandmother put pieces of her family members, her mother's and her aunt's clothing is in my quilt. And she told me the story of all the pieces of clothing that she put in my quilt. And these were tragic stories. Most of them were tragic, but some of them have very interesting history behind that cloth. And each chapter represents the clothing of that person and what that person meant to my grandmother. I'm thinking that this obviously is a a long running tradition in your family, but this must go way back in terms of African-American culture. Yes. Yes, it does. It goes back to my grandmother's mother who was also a quilter and she made quilts for the for the for the slave owners. And also these quilts were made according to my grandmother and my great grandfather's stories that they helped slaves escape because they would hang these quilts over fence posts and they would hang them from the trees. The slave master, I assume, thought that these quilts were drying (laughs) the reason that they hung the quilts. But actually it was a deeper meaning for these quilts to be hung on the trees. And I would listen. I would crawl up under the house because down in the country, the houses are way off the ground. Right. And I would lay up under the house with the chickens and listen to those stories of the escaping slaves and how those quilts guided them to freedom. 
you know, you had quilts that were blue and it looked like water and waves. And I would listen to them tell the story of the old master and how they fooled them by hanging that quilt out wow. and uh, threw the master off. So I grew up with these stories. Isn't that I, interesting? So this would kind of also give them directions to where the next safe house is or the, the way they should go? Yes, and the way they should go. The exactly. Underground Railroad, I guess, is what yes. we're talking about here. Yes, and I've listened to some amazing stories that these old people tell because a lot of people say that it's folklore and it didn't happen. But if I had not first person heard these stories, and I probably would say, well, you know, I would probably feel the same way. But to hear these stories, and they told them so eloquently with such deep conviction, I know it's to be true. Sure. Wow. So tell us some more stories that you learned at the feet of your grandmother. Her name was Lulu, right? Lula, uh -huh. L-U-L-A, Lula, mm -hmm. yes. She told me the story, I think one of the most saddest stories, and, and it was difficult to write. I, mean, I have to admit, it took me three years to write this book. But every time she told a story of her sister, Ella, well, let me go back a little bit. My grandmother's parents were born around eight, late 1830s, 1840s. And my grandmother had three siblings that were sold in slavery. They were sold while they were still nursing. So I'm assuming that they were babies when they were sold. And my grandmother thought that her mother would never have any more kids because she was barren because of her kids being sold in slavery. And it was, it was painful. Of course. But years later, many years later, my grandmother's sister Ella came around 1865, 1866. And my grandmother came along in 1883 after my great grandmother thought that she wasn't going to have any kids. But then one night, both my great grandparents and my grandmother's sister, Ella, all perished as a result of the aftermath of slavery. I won't tell how, but it was painful. But after that, my grandmother's entire lineage was wiped out because she didn't know any other relatives you know, probably because they were scattered about. So my grandmother was 13 at the time. So she buried her mother and she buried her sister, who was eight, nine years older than my grandmother. And my grandmother was basically on her own at 13. So she worked in houses in Laurel for one of the famous Rogers families. But she was by herself. And so she kept quilting and she worked for the Rogers for years. I came along in 1957 and I think she had stopped working for the Rogers somewhere around 1949. Mother mm -hmm. told great stories, just that passion for quilting and what the quilt itself was capable of. It's just like passing down history. That's why my grandmother made sure that I knew the history of her family and how they were sold away. It was almost like she was talking yeah. in a way that she knew that one day that I would find her family. Yes. And that's, that's been the course of my life, to spend my life trying to locate her family. But people ask me, how did you remember all those stories? And I said, <laughs> the same way I remembered Little Red Riding Hood and the Three Little Pigs. <laughs> and even today, I can recite you that entire story. That was the same way with my grandmother's stories, but my grandmother's stories were true stories. And it just remained with me year after year after year. I was in right. the military 20 years, and I deployed, and that's all I thought about, telling my grandmother's story. It gave me time to really think, really think about the importance of telling her story. Because my grandmother took me to the old slave cemetery that sat right across the road from where we live, maybe about um, not even a half a mile. Well, one day my grandmother took me to that cemetery, and the stones— it was the only way to identify that somebody was buried there because of a rock. One of the rocks had the word Mammy written on it. And it was just like, there wasn't any tombstones that we see today. They were just... Yeah, just a name. Just a name and an old wooden stick with, with carvings. But she said, she pointed to those graves. And it's something I will remember for the rest of my life. She said, you see these people laying here? These are the best stories you ain't never heard. And don't you ever forget that, child. Oh, and I remember that. So, Phyllis, tell us about this never-worn wedding dress that was worked into this old quilt that you have. Um, well, my grandmother's sister, Ella, the one I was talking about, who was killed as a result of the slave master's anger. And it was very, very, um, it was brutal. And she was due to get married and leave the slave master, and I won't tell you why. There's <laughs> a long story behind that. But he wanted her to remain. So my grandmother's sister, Ella, 
was supposed to marry a boy who basically was raised not far from the plantation where my great-grandparents lived and my grandmother at the time. And the slave master did not want my great-aunt Ella to leave, my grandmother's sister is Ella. So he basically destroyed her. And one night, he took her life. And as a result, my grandmother's mother passed away out of hurt. Sure. She just had a heart attack and died at the same night. And I won't tell you about my great grandfather that <laughs> you could read about that. But my great aunt Ella was due to be married to this guy who came back from New York to get her. And the slave master did not want her to leave. So he killed her. And my grandmother wiped her face with the wedding dress. Oh. And that wedding dress is in my quilt. And you can still see the stains that won't wash away that are pieces of my great aunt Ella's dress in my wow. quilt. What year was she killed, Phyllis? This was around 1899, 1898. Wow. And what roughly. a piece of history you've got in this quilt. You know, yes. I've had stories on before about people and quilts, but yours tell stories like I've never heard before. Absolutely unbelievable. The book is called Quilt of Souls, a memoir written by my guest, Phyllis Biffle Elmore. And you got a little taste of what's to be found in that book. It's out right now. Where can they get the book, Phyllis? They can order it on my website through Amazon at www.thequiltofsouls.com. That's T-H-E, thequiltofsouls.com. Or they can go directly to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, Walmart. It's sold in various bookstores. But if they want it directly, I, I would suggest either through my website or Amazon. Very nice. Thanks so much for your time. Great stories and good luck with the book. I'm sure it's going to be a big seller for you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You know, everybody has a story and those stories tend to last a long time, especially when they come from tragedy, slavery, the Holocaust. And coming up next, you're going to meet a couple of people who took a trip back to the mother's home country, Slovakia, because she had to escape from communism. And you're going to want to hear how she did it and the reaction of her daughter in this brand new episode from BYU TV, our sponsors. Coming up next when we return in five minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Hey, welcome back to Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, and I, you know, I'm so excited when we get a new sponsor on that has such an incredible product, such as BYU TV's show, How I Got Here. And if you haven't seen it yet, it's available for streaming in all the usual places and certainly from BYUTV.org. Let me give you a little background about how I got here. Yes, it's a travel log in one sense, but it's also an amazing family history in the process. This is where the younger generation gets to see where the older generation came from, typically from across the pond, and the circumstances that caused them to leave and come over here. And so the younger generation discovers the culture and the background of the parent. And in this case, it's Vivian and Simona Sasova from Slovakia. And Simona, you were the immigrant to Canada, and you got to take your daughter Vivian over to Slovakia and show her where you came from and go through your whole story. And having seen the episode, first of all, as I always tell people, you better have some Kleenex close by because these stories are really emotional. Yes, that is very true. This has been a life-changing experience, absolutely amazing. I was so happy and proud and humbled at the same time to be able to show Vivian a part of the life that she had never known, part of my life, and really where she comes from, to understand where her roots are from and to discover more about herself. I can imagine. Now, let's talk about Slovakia. At that time, it was under communist rule, so you were dealing with a very difficult situation. But you kind of came up with an escape plan by essentially creating this fake trip to Cuba that's going to have a stopover in Montreal. And this was an escape place for many people. And in the show, you kind of recreate exactly how this happened. And the fact that you were actually tailed by somebody to try to prevent you from defecting. Let's talk about that. 
Uh, yes, I was very lucky. First of all, I will start saying that not many were as lucky as I was. So as mentioned, during communism, it was impossible to go to any Western countries. People tried different ways and some succeeded, many did not. I knew through a grapevine really about this way that people were buying the whole trip vacation to go to Cuba and the plane would fly from Prague to Havana, but many times it would stop in Montreal to refuel. So I all the savings from my family the trip was extremely expensive and something completely unaffordable. But I got a support and we purchased the ticket. And first, before even going on it, I had to have permission from school, from doctor, and kind of vouching for me that I was not going to escape. And then once I was on the plane, I soon discovered, and I was warned a little bit about it, that there could be people from state government secret agents on board that will be watching for people like me trying to escape because this was one of the ways to go. And sure enough, the person like that was sitting right next to me oh. on a plane. Yes. And I was so stressed and I was so scared just sitting there. I didn't want to say something that would actually reveal what I was about to do. How old were you at the time? I was 18. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I was very young. Maybe that helped too, but uh, it was very difficult because, of course, I had to leave my family and I did not know when I was going to see them. I heard of some families that had members that escaped and they have not seen them for years, many years, 20 mm. years I'm talking about. So that was very difficult. But once we landed in Montreal, they took us to transit hall for us to be there for about an hour, I would say, while the plane is being refueled. That was the policy at the time that passengers could not stay on board. From there, this is what I heard, is that you escape from there. But I didn't know where to go. And I tried to first hide in a washroom, but the door were just kind of like a saloon doors. They did not go all the way down. And there were people using washroom sites. I, that was not a good idea. So I just stepped out and I was kind of pacing around. And this guy that was sitting next to me, he came to me and he says, Canada does not accept any more political refugees. Yeah, I was so scared. And suddenly this commissioner looked at me and he said, do you want to stay in Canada? And I just I said, yes. And I remember just following him and he opened this door and there was kind of a red line on, on the floor and I crossed it. And this is when I realized that I did it. I, I immigrated. I was free. At and that I moment. Heard in a, at that moment. Yes, that was the decisive and most significant moment. And I still could hear the guy yelling after me, Simona, come back, Simona. And I was taking pictures and, and all this. But I suddenly just kind of felt I was stepping into a new world. Wow. What an incredible story. And Vivian, this was probably a new story to you, too, because as I understand from the TV show, you really didn't know that much about your mom's background. Yeah, I had no idea. And that's why I take it so to heart, this journey we went on, because 22 years, I said, we live together every day, we're together. And not once did we talk about it. Not once did I even ask to hear the whole story. So it was really eye opening. And just now I know everything. And how was that for you to go over to Slovakia and take in the places that she had grown up and meet some of her family? It was really incredible. I met some people that I've never met before. And even though now with social media, it's still very hard to get in touch with those people, especially because they're older and they don't use all the social media that we use so it was really amazing to get in touch with them and even also hearing it from them and how they thought about the whole thing and what they knew and what they didn't. It was just so amazing. And now I know all of this and now I'm even more in touch with them. And it was just an incredible experience. So I saw this scene with you guys in a shop where you were trying on some traditional Slovakian clothes and your mom offered to buy that for you. And I thought that was quite a moment for you because it seemed to me at that moment you were embracing your culture. Yes, definitely. I mean, the whole time since the first second that I walked in the store, I just fell in love with the colors, with the dresses. And myself being a dancer before, it was something that 
I was like, okay, I really need to have this. And I was already thinking about like, okay, I can't forget. I need to ask the lady how much they cost. I need to ask her how could I ship one to Canada. So when she told me that, okay, no, this one is yours. And especially after knowing how it's important in the Slovak culture and how it's important for a woman to own one of these It was just such a beautiful moment and I just I wear it all the time and every family gathering we have I I put it on and it's just it's an honor to have one. You kind of feel Slovak now. I really do feel uh, 100% Slovak. Yes. That's really interesting. So Simona, was this your first time back since you defected? No, no. I went back a couple of times. It was very different this time, first of all, because it was with Vivian. And I pretty much went there and visited some family, but not really my friends. So, for example, seeing my friends from high school after 30-some years since I escaped was just wonderful. It really brought me back to the time you know, where we were you know, at school together. It seems like for you, Simona, this was a healing trip, and for Vivian, it was kind of an enlightenment. Is that true, ladies? That is excellent. (laughs) Yes, exactly. The excellent description. Perfectly said. Well, for people who want to see this show and this episode in particular, the show is How I Got Here. It's on BYU TV, and you can see it online. It's it's easy to get and stream it. Check it out and enjoy the show. And ladies, thanks for coming on. It's very emotional and really interesting to see, and it was just a, a real thrill to get to talk to you guys. Thank you very much. It was our pleasure. Thank you for having us. And coming up next, it's time to answer your questions on Ask Us Anything with me and David Allen Lambert when we return in three minutes on Extreme Genes America's Family History Show. Genies, our friends at BYU TV have a new series out created just for us, family historians. It's called How I Got Here. It's a fast-paced travel show where young adults accompany their immigrant parents back to where they came from, their countries of origin. These are 10-day trips of a lifetime where these parent-child duos relive the sacrifice, struggle, and circumstances that led their families to leave to where they are now. There's a new episode every week with visited countries including Italy, Serbia, Mexico, Chile, Israel, Slovakia, and Ghana. BYU TV is on Roku and Fire Stick, online at BYUTV.org, or through the BYU TV app. How I Got Here is available now with a new episode every week. Feel the impact this journey has on those who grew up not knowing. And just a warning, keep a box of Kleenex nearby. You're going to need it. Genies, it's Family History Month, and our friends at Legacy Tree Genealogists are celebrating by offering for a very limited time $300 off the price of a 100-hour genealogy research project. That's a lot of hours of research by some of the field's top experts. It's the perfect time to order that unique and personalized family history gift at a great price. But you must hurry. This offer ends on Saturday, November 5th. Just go to LegacyTree.com and use the promo code HISTORY. History 300. That's one word, History 300. Legacy Tree Genealogist has been around for over 18 years and has experts covering every state and virtually every country in the world. If you've been wanting to discover your family story, take advantage of this remarkable Family History Month discount. $300 off the price of a 100-hour genealogy research project. Once again, use the promo code HISTORY300 at LegacyTree.com. Offer ends November 5th. Hey, Genies. Ancestry now has an exclusive partnership with PhotoMine, the leader in photo scanning and archiving. What does this mean to you? Well, imagine inheriting an old photo album and you want to digitize all the images. Up until now, you'd have to remove the pictures, place them in a scanner, crop them, and perhaps use Photoshop to improve them. Now, by using these amazing PhotoMine tools from Ancestry, you can use your phone to take a picture of an entire page from your album. The tools will automatically separate and crop each picture, improve focus, and restore color or colorize your 
images. Then you can assign which picture goes to which person on your tree. If you've been waiting years to get around to the tedious project of scanning your old albums, it's been worth the wait. No more pulling your photo albums apart and trying to reinsert the pictures back in proper order. No more tearing of your old photos while removing them from those so-called magnetic albums of the 1970s. Sign in to Ancestry through their mobile app to try it out. Time once again for Ask Us Anything on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. I am Fisher. That's David Allen Lambert over there from Boston. Say hi, Dave. Hello there. And we have our first question from Carrie Ann in Nashville, Tennessee. She says, Dave and Fish, I know my great-grandfather had a mortuary in Boise, Idaho in the late 19th century and early 20th century. Where can I find records on his business. Thanks for all you do, Carrie Ann. Well, Carrie Ann, if you listen to our show, you probably have heard our suggestion, eBay. You might not (laughs) think about eBay as an option, but if you had a business card or a billhead or records or even an account book, that's top dollar for collectibles all day long. And you can put a search in eBay for that company name and your great-grandfather's name and the place, and you may find matches. Yep. Um, so that's one thing. It's great you mentioned that, Dave. I actually found an invoice to my great-grandfather's business in New York from the 1870s, and it was 28 bucks. I mean, these people mm-hmm. know that if you're interested in it, it's because you're either interested in the field or a specific company. And I have that search term on eBay, and then if something comes in that matches it, then that generates an email to you, and you could Mm -hmm. obtain that item. I was shocked. There were actually four of them that were on sale, and so I got what I wanted and then notified some other descendants, and they went out and got the rest. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, which is pretty obvious, city directories, newspapers, and of course, with more newspapers being indexed, like newspapers.com, you can search U.S. city directories on ancestry.com. There's so many different ways you can do this from the comfort of your own home, where 25, 30 years ago, you'd have to get in the car and go crank through microfilm or uh, not saying that that's still not fun, but there's a little more uh, <laughs> road trip involved. Maybe go find out where the business was and see if the building's still there. Well, and what about the obituaries, Dave? I mean, wouldn't a mortuary have an ad near the obits? Absolutely. And the other thing about old funeral homes and mortuaries, fish, sometimes they're purchased by other companies. True that. So therefore, you could find that there's a successor business. In my town, we've had the same funeral home since 1860. Huh. Same name? And slightly different, but part of the original name is still there. Interesting. In Salt Lake City, the State Historical Society has a whole section devoted to one particular funeral home from the beginning of the last century, and it has photographs in there, invoices. In fact, I found all the records on the death of one of my second great-grandparents on my mother's side. I was just amazed. I mean, I could see the cost of his coffin, the cost of the burial site, the cost of the carriage, which carried his body and those who went with him on the trip. So, I mean, every last detail was in there. And I just thought that was unbelievable. The other thing is reach out to your cousins, Carrie, and you never know who has what in their attic. So if the business closed up, maybe the youngest child got the business records and they're still sitting in the bar now. Yeah, and the youngest is often the one because of the fact that they're still in the house the longest, right? And so they wind up with all those things. Otherwise, sometimes it's the child that kind of takes over, which is sometimes the oldest person, right? That's very true. So the other thing is look up your undertaker himself and see what funeral parlor they used for his funeral because maybe that's the one that bought out his company. <laughs> Possible. Well, that No, I like the way you're thinking there. That's just sometimes how it goes. you got to think out of the box and figure these things out. So that is a, a great question, Carrie Ann, and thanks. You really got us noodling on this whole thing, and there are some ideas that you might come up with as well as you consider what you're looking for. So best of luck in your search. And coming up next, we got another question about shopping for the holidays and what we might be able to give to people in the family history world. Coming up next when we return in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show.
All right, here we go for our final segment of Ask Us Anything on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. And, uh, David, this question comes from Dallas, Texas. Cole is asking, guys, since we're getting close to the holidays, what are some really cool family history-related gifts that I could give? Ooh. Yeah, the, the list is pretty Let's, long for this one, isn't it? <laughs> well, and salute to our friend Diane. Get yeah. a DNA test. <laughs> yes, a DNA test for somebody would be great. I can't tell you how many people I've helped with DNA test results when they got uh-huh. a test for the holidays and they didn't know what to do with it. So they love getting those things. How about snapfish.com? Has, have you been there? Oh. I love it. I use it for all my autograph needs, making up pictures to send out. But I know you can use it for other things. Yeah, I uh, recently actually created mugs using ancestral pictures and buildings and places and times and created mugs for four different family members, including myself. One coffee Mm -hmm. mug with the picture of my great-grandfather's coffee, tea, and spice business in New York on it from the 1870s, along with the invoice we talked about in the last segment, pictures Mm -hmm. of the partners who were the brothers, some letterhead, and pictures of some of the spice cans they created. And this wraps all the way around the coffee mug. And so when I drink my hot chocolate, it's all right there for me to look at. I really enjoy having it. And then I made one for my brother, my sister, my cousin, all devoted to things that they love. And they're just blown away by it. They're just 16 bucks to make a 15 ounce mug and about $8 to ship it. But it's quick and easy and you don't have to ship it. They'll do it for you. And Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's just a great thing to do and very easy to make. Well, I'll drink to that. That's great. Yes. (laughs) And another thing, and we always talk about eBay, think about buying something historic, as cheap as a penny postcard. Of an old school. Yeah. Maybe the hospital that your cousin was born in for their 80th birthday or, you know, something of a scene of the downtown area where you might have a cousin who lived in a small town. Well, what it looked like back then, you get that penny postcard. And if you get it quick enough from eBay, turn it around with Snapfish and turn it into a postcard on a coffee mug or on a towel or whatever. You know, I mean, it's amazing. You can print anything. You can make drapery if you wish. (laughs) Bed sheets and blankets. It's an amazing place. And, you know, you can also get posters with Mm -hmm. the family trees on it or descendancy charts, including photos of your people. Uh Obviously, our friends over at Family Chart Masters do a great job with that kind of thing. And so many choices in terms of design with that. It's very true. And it's it's really amazing how many things they can do uh, in poster land these days. So you ought to check that out. Of course, we're running out of time for some of these things because those companies are going to get flooded with so much request to create art. You really have to get on that right away. Well, on that note, then why not make a 2023 calendar with ancestral pictures? Yep. Those are great. We've done that Mm -hmm. before. Ancestral Mm -hmm. photos, you can clean them up with Photoshop, make a nice copy, have it framed. How about Mm -hmm. this, David? A subscription to a well-known website like Ancestry.com. Exactly. Or if you have Ancestry.com, give them an add-on like newspapers.com or Fold3. Yeah. I salute that anytime. Yeah, absolutely. So there are really a lot of different things you can do. Just look around and kind of figure out what they are interested in or what they might be interested in going mm-hmm. forward and go from there. So, you know, as you can see, there's a lot of stuff you can do for the holidays, but you got to get on it right now because we're getting awfully close, especially for some of those things that might require a little extra work. So. Thanks for the question, Cole and David. Thanks for being here as always. And we will talk to you next week. All right. Until then. All right. And thanks once again to our guests, Phyllis Biffle Elmore, author of Quilt of Souls, an amazing story she told, and Vivian and Simona from BYU TV's How I Got Here. If you've missed any of the show, of course, catch the podcast on TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, ExtremeGenes.com, Spotify. We are all over the place. Thanks for joining us. We'll talk to you again next week. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. Thank you.